All right, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our final content webinar for our business best practices and management webinar series. My name is Meg Beyer. I am part of the MCTAC and CTAC team, and I'm thrilled to be joined today um, by our expert content lead, our partner and colleague, David Worzniak, who's going to take us through the majority of the material today. Our content that we're focusing on today is really around quality, documentation, and compliance. Um, so we're thrilled that so many folks are joining and are interested in this topic. A few things before we get kicked off. Um, like I said, today is the final uh, content webinar in our business uh, best practices and management webinar series. For those of you who may have joined for other webinars or might be interested, we have three other webinars that have been recorded, and the recordings along with the slides have been posted to the MCTAC and CTAC website. Um, just like today's webinar, we are, we're going to record today's webinar, so we'll post both the recording and the slides to our website. So if you want to review this afterwards or if you want to share this with colleagues, um, you can visit MCTAC's website or CTAC's website as well and find the recording and the slides there um, as well. The other thing to say is that even though the content webinars are finishing, that doesn't mean the series is over just yet. Um, in two weeks, on April 30th, we are going to be having a um, office hours, an office hours with both uh, David Wozniak and our two other presenters, Fern um, Zagor and Rob Alfini, who have done some of our other webinars. So the office hours are really an opportunity for anyone who has joined any of the webinars or has any questions on the topics that we've covered to ask our experts. So we'd ask that you sign up. It's, it's the same platform and functionality as these webinars. Um, and we'll be asking you on the office hours if you have questions to chat them in. So that brings me to my next area of logistics. We are going to take questions today, much like we've done in all of our previous webinars. What we're asking that you do is that you chat the questions in using the chat box functionality that can be found on the right-hand side panel of your screen. So we've reserved time at the end of the webinar to review the questions, but that doesn't mean that you have to wait until the end of the webinar to chat your questions in. So what we'd ask that you would do is that you chat your questions in using that chat box functionality and that you chat them in to all panelists. You'll see when you are looking at the chat box, there's a, a downward arrow that you can click and it allows you to select all panelists. So if you do that, it enables both myself, my colleague Kevin, who is the MCTAC administrative host on the back end, and David to see the questions as they come in. Um, and finally, I just want to thank everyone um, who was able to join for joining today. There is a lot going on right now in our world and, um, you know, finding time to carve out space for an hour webinar is, it's a challenge. And so I want to thank you for finding this time. I do hope everyone is well. Um, and just to say that, you know, good quality and compliance and documentation practices are always important. It doesn't matter what crisis or time period we're in, they're always very important. But now so more than ever, given the response to the pandemic and the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, having good quality and compliance practices and good solid documentation practices is more important than ever. I think David's going to talk a little bit about that. But I just wanted to frame that even though we started this webinar series well in advance, <laughs> developing this well in advance of what we're currently experiencing today, we think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is very relevant to what we're all experiencing and can really align um, organizations and agencies for success in navigating these rather uncharted waters that we're all in right now. So again, I want to thank you all for joining. I want to thank my colleague Kevin for running things on the back end. And I think with that, David, I'm going to ask you to take over and uh, walk us through your presentation. And I'll be back for questions at the end. Absolutely. Thank you, Meg, Thank and you. welcome, mm -hmm. everybody. Um, happy to be with you this afternoon. As Meg said, I think quality documentation and compliance are critical issues at any time, but I think they're probably not more critical, but as equally important now, because as, as my guess is as we come out of the 
back end of this when that happens, uh, there's going to be a lot of retrospective look back. Um, and we as providers and organizations are going to need to have very solid documentation and be able to demonstrate compliance to the relaxed regulations uh, and uh, platforms that we're, we're allowed to work with right now. Um, and so um, I applaud your efforts to remind yourself of these things, and we'll get started. We talk a lot about quality. Uh, we have quality metrics, and you know, with this whole VBP, value-based and performance-based contracting, talk about process metrics, uh, quality outcome metrics. But as I was putting together the content, the thought occurred to me is, I don't, I'm not even sure what the definition of quality should be. So I did a little research, and I found a couple that I liked in terms of quality of behavioral health services as a definition. I put the two here. The one that on the left is a, the degree to which behavioral health care services for individuals and population increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes. And I, it, it's obviously important what's the quality. It's, it's how well we do at um, increasing the likelihood of desired health outcomes. But the more operational bit, uh, uh, definition that I like is doing the right thing for the right individual at the right time in the right way to achieve the best possible results. It really, for me, brings into play all of the components. It brings in the components of best practices. It brings in the components of access. It, um, there's a measurement piece in here, um, and there's a movement towards the best possible results. So I like this kind of idea of, of quality. So what it might be six aims for high-quality services? Well. I think, first of all, they have to be safe. I mean, it, you know, you can't be, you have to avoid negative con consequences for the care that you're providing that is intended to help. You need to keep an eye on that. They certainly need to be effective. Um, and we're talking more and more about evidence-based practices as bringing more of a science into the work that we're doing to be able to demonstrate and provide services that are effective. Certainly patient-centered or client-centered, that's, that's the, the respect for individual preferences, the understanding of individual prefer, uh, preferences, and being able to weave those into our practices and the way that we communicate with our clients in the community. Certainly timely, there's been a lot of work over the last couple of years uh, open access. We all know that many people struggle with getting to the point that, of asking for help and reaching out to others. And once they do that, we have a window there, a critical window for engagement. So really being able to do, provide the right treatment to the right people at the right time is um, significant. Certainly efficient. Um, our, you know, an aim of high quality is to efficient to support it by good business practices. Um, we all struggle with finding and retaining good quality clinical staff. Are we using those clinical staff effectively? Are we using the resources that we get from the state uh, effectively? Are we are we keeping on top of new technologies? Can that can support best practices and inefficiencies in our business operations. And that's our responsibility as part of our, our uh, movement towards high quality services and certainly equitable. We need to provide care that's unaffected by personal characteristics. Um, and uh, so I think that these are important kind of factors to be thinking about when we, we think about quality. So we have a definition of quality. We, we think a little bit about what are, um, what are our aims of quality and what are the domains that we should be thinking about and talking about. Um, but a real key component here is quality improvement. Quality doesn't happen all by itself. Uh, quality requires an improving quality 
requires a systematic and continuous process. We have to identify gaps in our systems and our processes, make changes to better client outcomes or efficiencies, uh, and better our agency and system performance. I'd like to focus on a couple of things here, uh, systematic and continuous. Many times when I'm doing presentations to groups in person and I'm talking about quality, I'll, I'll ask the group, I'll say, let me see a show of hands who everybody who have a quality improvement process, and pretty much everybody raises their hand. And then I said, okay, every, let me see a show of hands who those organizations that have a systematic and continuous quality improvement program that meets regularly, that evaluates gaps in quality, and makes changes to processes uh, that imp improves quality and then measures that improvement. And you'd be surprised. Well, maybe not, but you'd be, you know, I'm normally surprised at how few people raise their hand. So what I find is that we talk a lot about quality, we understand quality improvement, but I think organizationally many times we fall down uh, in our ability to implement something that's continuous, which means regular, and systematic, which means in my mind that has a structure to it. So let's talk a little bit about what I think are some important ways to structure out your quality improvement. Uh, a lot of us have, have run across the, the PDCA, um, and, but I think that there's a, there's a step before that. There's a step before we start actually implementing changes, and I like this kind of model that begins with focus. So the first thing you have to do is you have to find opportunities for improvement. Uh, sometimes you may have a process in place that you you, you put in place to improve certain outcomes or processes. Um, which is what, where are the opportunities for improvement? Uh, what can we do better? What's important as it relates to our mission or to our payers or to our community? Uh, where we believe that we have an opportunity to do a better job uh, than we're doing right now. Then we need to organize a team. I mean, again, quality just doesn't happen. It needs a process and it needs people and it needs people to staff it. Uh, so we need to put the team together and we need to put the team together that can, in my mind, you always need to have team members, at least one team member that can actually uh, implement change, that has some kind of authority. Because in most cases, quality improvement uh, activities require you to change something, to implement a new process, to change an existing process, to maybe even ask people to do their work differently than they did in the past. And without some level of authority or sponsorship for your quality improvement, you may have difficulty at the implementation side. So think about organizing your quality improvement team. Um, Quality improvement requires measurement, so you'll need some folks from the data side. That means change in processes, so you may need some folks from the operational side. Uh, it's going to need oversight, so you might need some supervisors, some clinical leadership, financial leadership. Put a good, solid team together. And then clarify the current knowledge and processes that influence your opportunities to improve. What is available for you to change? What do you know about it? Uh, do you need more data to move forward? Uh, let's understand before we move forward. I can't tell you the number of times as, a, as an executive leader that I ask people to stop figure, coming up with solutions before we've really identified what the problem is. You have to drill down and understand you know, what you know and what processes are in hand. And then understand the variation that contributes to the problem. What, what's, is something wor not working because 
you didn't communicate well and the processes aren't being followed. I mean, there's all kinds of situations that can be on play here. And the last is to select and start the PDA cycle to improve your outcomes. So what we want to do is where are the opportunities? Let's put the team together. Let's understand what the problem is. Um, let's understand some of the variations that and some of the variables that impact upon this. Then let's start the next phase of the process. You can't really ignore this first stage if you move into a good quality program. So then let's the next step would be to continue on to the PDCA, plan, do, check, and act. Certainly people have heard about this. This has been talked about a lot as we talk about quality improvement. The first thing is to plan the action. What are you going to do? Uh, you're going to put a test or, or pilot a test, uh, proof of concept. Because we've already come to a point where we believe we've understood, the, we understand the process. So we're going to put a plan in place. What are we going to do different? If we want to improve something, in most cases, we need to do something differently. And certainly at the plan stage, we need to put a plan in place for measuring performance and collecting data. We have to know when what we've put in place has been effective. Um, so the next thing is do, you implement it. Implement the intervention, implement the process change, implement changes in responsibilities, uh, whatever it's necessary and begin collecting your data. Check, analyze your data. Is the intervention working? Don't wait forever. Don't wait six months to figure out. Have a good data measurement that will give you pretty quick feedback. Um, you have a problem, you've identified an issue. You can't wait six months uh, necessarily to figure out with what you put in place is actually going to impact upon that. We need to move that, that process more, more quickly. And, and if our data um, tells us that, you know, the brilliant ideas we put together as a team are not working, uh, we need, we need to, uh, to pivot quickly. And uh, that's the act phase. Don't be afraid that if your process is not effective, uh, take what you learned and keep moving forward until you get it right. And sometimes these, there's layers. So you'll, you'll, you'll have to do something first. Maybe you'll have to put a data collection system in place first. And then secondly, you have to change one act part of the process, uh, and that's good. Now you have to change another part of the process. So it's really a continuous process that, and sometimes your act phase in, in is, uh, becomes your plan phase. Um, oops, just one second. All right. So I put this slide in, I'm implementing change, follow principles of change management. I don't hear enough conversation about change management because here we have an improvement process. And improvement and quality improvement implies change. But I think that you know, we, we, we fail in two areas. We fail in the systematic continuous part of quality improvement. But I think we also fail on the understanding of change management. You hear this all the time. Change is hard. Change is difficult. But and the saying that I always had, which is actually even more true today, is in today's environment, change is truly the only constant. So we have to learn how to manage change better. And there are a couple principles here that I think are extremely important and I think it would be very helpful for you guys to think through a little bit more. And so change management really focuses on planning, managing, and reinforcing. And for me, there are just absolutely critical elements. The first is communication. Why are we doing this? Who are we requiring to change? What are the expected outcomes? What are the benefits to the organization? What are the benefits to the individuals and families we serve? What is the benefits to the, uh, to the community? What is the benefit to the organization? Why are we asking you to do things differently? I always found that you can engage people in change if they understood. And even if they don't like it, 
if you're able to communicate and there's an implicit understanding and you're able to communicate that well, you can get by it. And so that's at the top of my list, communication. The other is sponsorship. Where is this coming from? Is it coming from the board? Is it coming from executive leadership? Is it coming from chief of operations? Uh, there needs to be a high-level organizational sponsorship of change. And then coaching. Not everybody learns the same way. Not everybody has the time to move forward as you quickly. You, sometimes you need to do hand-holding. Uh, sometimes you need to provide information to people in different ways so they understand better. You just can't throw somebody in and say, here, sink or swim. Um, if they're sinking, you need to throw them a, a life preserver and help them and coach them and, and mentor them. Uh, training and tools, you train them. This is where I find we find most of the problem. We don't adequately, first of all, give people tools that they're going to need to manage the change, nor do they tr we train them significantly or sufficiently to be able to work that change into their normal workflows. And the final is resistance management. We sometimes jump to conclusions when people resist. We, they resist because they just don't want to do it. It's a personality thing. I always stop and say, no, let's go back. Is this our problem? Did we communicate? Did we have a good sponsor? Did we do the coaching? We, did we train? Did we give them the tools? If you can honestly answer the questions that you did all of these things well, then managing resistance is something sometimes a difficult thing to do. It could result in changing responsibilities and even an up to termination, but you don't go down that path until you absolutely are feel comfortable that you followed these other areas of change management. So we're going to you're going to find through this presentation we're going to change topics pretty abruptly. So um, after talking about thinking about what quality is, thinking about what the primary domains of quality are, what a process to be systematic about your change uh, improvement, and then how you manage these changes, we're going to ju jump over to documentation. Now, documentation is ingrained in us, in our thinking, in what we do. Uh, it's what we teach people right from the beginning, and it's obviously a critical piece, uh, not only on the clinical side. We're going to address more clinical documentation here, but certainly on the finance side also as uh, documentation. I think one of the things that we're beginning to talk about in this environment on the financial side, there are a number of different resources available, loans and grants that are coming out through the federal government. And what we're beginning to talk with people about is how critical it is to document what you're doing, what you're using funds for, how you're meeting the eligibility requirements, because when this is all over, there's going to be audits. Uh, there's going to be a retrospective review of what we're doing. and to be able to mitigate our risk and be able to prove that we re used our resources wisely, that we followed the, regula the relaxed regulations to a T, um, our ability, we're going to have to rely upon our documentation. I think that in this environment, risk mitigation is absolutely critical. And Documentation is the foundation upon which we will stand. So let's talk about why is it important. I mean, some of these things, you know, sure, it's, it records how the client needs were met um, and across different levels of care. And it's really a continuity of care document of, you know, what was done by whom, when. Uh, Central for Risk Management, shared decision-making, coordination of care and evaluating results. We're seeing a lot more sharing of documentation, so different uh, providers that are working with, the organ with uh, individual clients can better coordinate the care, avoid duplication, and that really builds upon the documentation we, we, we provide. So now 
now we're providing documentation not only for our internal providers, but some of our external providers. Uh, it facilitates quality improvement, uh, review of documentation by supervisors, and it's obviously needed to comply with the laws and regulations for not only for Medicaid, for Medicare, for our third-party payers. Uh, there's obviously very clear documentation rules and requirements that we must uh, be following. So with some of the qualities of effective documentation, clear, timely, and well-organized. Documentation is gone, gone, done contemporaneously. Um, I, I like this one. I've, I've come to, I spend my days uh, talking to people, working with different providers, and I have a little Word document up, and I take notes all the time because I don't know about you, but I have trouble remembering what I said to whom two days ago, let alone a week ago. So these concepts of contemporaneous documentation, I like the idea of, of collaborative uh, documentation also is, is that to really be able to record the nuances of the work that we do, it has to be done as soon after the event as possible. Now, I know that's, that's difficult in, today, in today's environment when we're jumping from one thing to the next, but documentation needs to be current. Uh, it needs to be concise, factual, current, specific, because now that we're providing documentation not only internally but externally, we don't need people who need, can't read a book to be able to figure out what's going on and where they fit in. Uh, they need something pretty concise and factual. Uh, effective doc documentation demonstrates continuity of care. We have case managers. We need to coordinate. We need to have a continuity of care. We need to make sure that we understand how people are moving through the system. Um, and so the documentation is going to capture baseline. Uh, it's going to show progress. And it's going to demonstrate how the client's needs were addressed. And of course, supervisors should review client records with their staff to pr promote quality, consistency, and regulatory re uh, compliance. This is part of your uh, the compliance piece that we'll talk about later. Um, most of our staff don't new staff don't walk in being good documenters. Um, I don't think it's something that is routinely taught. It's maybe something that they've got in an internship, um, but we're responsible for teaching, um, for having standards, internal uh, standards for our organization, and training our individual staff to follow those standards um, and it is the supervisor's responsibility to assure that uh, those standards are being met, that there's a consistency across our providers in the way that they're documenting, and that absolutely our documentation is meeting our regulatory requirements. So we talk a little bit about the golden thread. So documentation is a process. It's not, documentation is not busy work. Um, and documentation is a critical component of, of the interventions that we do. It's a critical component for communication to other providers, and it's a critical component of our communication with our clients, and it sort of runs through a process. We well, obviously start with assessment. Uh, once we've assessed, and there's normally a diagnostic phase where we sort of categorize from the assessments, what, what we think are some of the underlying conditions. But, but we should start from a strength. So here's the diagnosis. What are the strengths? What is the, what is, we talked about client-centered. What is, what is the individual's personal goal? What are the strengths that, that we build off of? And then after we've identified the strengths, then we can identify the gaps. What are the needs? Where do I fit in as a service provider? Where does the organization fit in? Where does the case manager who's working with this individual fit in? Where does the peer that may be working with this individual fit in? How does this all get coordinated? And that gets articulated, defined in the service plan. And we have goals. 
What is the goal? We have objectives. What are the activities? Uh, what, what are we going to be focusing on? And then we have the interventions and services, exactly what's happening. What are we going to do? What, do, what have we agreed with our clients, our important kind of changes, resources that they can activate, uh, situations that they can change that will be effective. And then that, those interactions are they're directed by the service plan and they're recorded in the progress note. I think that sometimes we think as a documentation as a necessary evil. Um, I, I think that if that's the case, we need to change our thinking and we need to think about documentation as being a critical component of quality of care that we're providing uh, to the individuals that we serve. And one of the pieces in terms of compliance today, we do know that you know we have some relaxed rules. So now we can we can provide services by telehealth with a verbal uh, uh, approval uh, consent by the uh, individual that we're working with. Well, it has to be documented clearly. Um, we may be able to provide services and be billed for telephonically, which we had not been before. Well, that has to be documented. The uh, modifier code has to be put on that bill. We have, there are changes along with the relaxation of some of the rules that we've been following to allow us to provide care in the, in the crisis. Documentation becomes the cornerstone upon which we can prove that we're meeting the minimum standards that are required. And at the end of the day, if we're audited, we'll be able to keep that revenue that we build. Uh, so it's pretty critical right now that we've trained our staff, particularly our remote staff who may be working from home, is, is that now this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do differently. This is what you need to do every single time and have your compliance and quality assurance people uh, on top of those, particularly here uh, in the beginning. Um, after a while, people are going to get used to this. It's going to be built into their thinking. They're not going to forget about that. But my recommendation is you're, you're probably, when we first pivoted and transitioned to telehealth as our primary service delivery platform, that all of those services get reviewed. Uh, to make sure that we've properly documented those so that we can retain that revenue uh, and have a consistency across our, uh, our provider group and meet our regulatory requirements. Common red flags are areas of concerns. Um, although I was a CFO for 32 years, I actually began my career as a substance use counselor and then became a mental health counselor and a mental health supervisor and a program manager. And I used to review, as a supervisor, I used to review uh, case notes and, and documentation all the time. This documentation is a cookie cutter. I remember working with folks is that Surprise, 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 they said the same thing or worked on the same thing for almost every single client, or they used the same phrases all the time. And they, and to me, that was a sign that they're really not, first of all, picking up on the nuances, or secondarily, maybe they're not doing their uh, documentation contemporaneously. So they're searching back in their mind what did I say? What did I do? What did they say? Um, and uh, those kind of, it's kind of blurred. And so you see the same kind of responses time and time again. Um, I find that sometimes you get negative provider opinions or language. And the question I always ask is there an inherent bias here? Does this provider or counselor have a bias here that they're reflecting in the language? Um, are they, can, can, if they're thinking this way, uh, are they communicating this way? Are there, um, is their body language communicating 
uh, negative thoughts? Can you truly engage if this is the way you're thinking? So I think that those are pretty, those are red flags that I, I looked at for in, in documentation. Um, private details that are not relevant to treatment goals. I mean, I, is your counselor going into areas that really isn't relevant, that doesn't really re, uh, need to be areas that are being explored? As, um, are is your counselor losing a little bit of focus in what they're doing? And then when treatment plans, service plans, and progress zones, they don't clearly tie together. If you go back to that, that sort of a thread, it, it, it works through. You have, you did your assessment. You understand the strengths. You've identified the gaps. Um, you put together the service plan. And so if, if those don't tie together, either that was done poorly and you need to go back and rethink that, which is the case. I mean, when we begin working with people early in care, uh, things develop. There are changes. That's why we do update the service plans. But if these pieces don't tie together, then that is a red flag about the way either that the documentation is going on or the way that our clinicians are working with their clients. So documentation, some things to remember. I love the first one. I said it all the time. So if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Can't bill for it. Uh, what you did is not available for an external provider to understand. If there's a crisis and somebody has to follow up for you, that information is not available to you. If it's not there, it didn't happen. Uh, I'm, in years, I've changed that, and now I say if it's not in my if it's not in my schedule, it's not going to happen. But it's the same kind of thing. If it's not documented, it didn't happen. More is not better. It's really quality over quantity. You want to be able to look at the documentation, understand quickly uh, what is going on, what was done. Uh, if, I'm, if I can't read a book to understand in a crisis, to understand if I'm filling in, to understand where I might interject myself to be helpful. Um, it's not history taken. We don't have notes. It's not just talking about what people talk about. Um, and it's peace. Know the mission of your program, the regulations, and the purpose behind the required documentation. You know, again, documentation, it's not busy work. It's a critical component of our, of our intervention. It, and it can, in fact, help in engagement as we work collaboratively with our and the individuals we serve and, and use documentation in part as a platform. And I think sometimes we forget this. It is the client's record. Uh, and it should ultimately serve the client's need and show their progress towards recovery. That's why I like collaborative documentation. That concept wasn't around back in the old, old days when I did uh, clinical work, but I think it can really be a very uh, helpful tool as we work uh, with our clients. Another abrupt change, so that's really the piece that I had in documentation, but documentation is a foundational piece of corporate compliance. So let's talk a little bit about corporate. What is corporate compliance? Well, corporate compliance program, it's, it, what does it, it, it speaks to an organization's long-term commitment to conduct business in a way that promotes doing the right thing. It's a process and a structure. You have to remember that. It is a process and a structure, and there's part of this quality improvement. It's a continuous monitoring, and that it's an ability and willingness to respect change and change problems that are identified. People make mistakes. We, may, we do things incorrectly. We don't follow regulations, but it's our responsibility to find them and fix them. And they're going to be, they're going to be taking a look at a number of different domains, billing, payments, medical necessity, governance, mandatory reporting, credentialing, and other risk areas. Let's speak a little bit about fraud, waste, and abuse because that's an important aspect of of corporate compliance, frauds, wrongful or criminal deception. Uh, for a gain, waste is thoughtless or careless expenditures, and abuse is excessive or improper use of things. 
These are the kind of things is that corporate compliance programs uh, need to focus on. Things like billing for services that weren't provided, upcoding, uh, intentionally billing for more expensive treatment than was provided, billing for unnecessary services. Um, so, and, and it's serious. What are the consequences? Prisons, fines, repayments of Medicaid or Mer Medicare, uh, being placed on a Medicaid exclusion list. I mean, these are not inconsequential results. And our corporate compliance program is in place because we do understand is, is that not everybody is honest. In finance, we have this concept of internal controls. I think of the corporate compliance program as the same thing. These are the internal controls that we put in place to protect our clients, our staff, and our um, and the organization. So what are the elements? Um, I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail. Policy and procedure, program oversight, training, communication, standards, auditing, uh, responding to offense offensive uh, correction action plans and non-retaliation and non-intimidation for people who report. So you need to have a compliance plan. These are best practices. Uh, so you take a look at this and you say, okay, if we're not doing all these things, and I'm not necessarily following best practices. Um, and so these are the kind of best practice things that we recommend. First of all, you have to have a compliance plan. You have to have a compliance plan. And that should be on your intranet or your website or both. Uh, it should uh, outline the benefits of the program and really be written and get people to buy in. Yeah, this is important. I should be thinking and following this. This is important for me to integrate into my thinking. Should have a code of conduct that everybody should review annually. Has to have oversight. So you have to have a compliance officer. The compliance officer reports directly to the governing board. Um, if it, they don't, uh, if they're not supervised by the CEO, you have to have you have to have regular updates to the CEO. Uh, the compliance committee has to have membership, including the governing body. Where I've seen that work best is that that compliance committee is a is a committee of the board. Uh, privacy and security officers are involved in those meetings. Privacy and security. Security is going to focus more on infrastructure. They have to have a more technical framework to be uh, to be effective. And the privacy officer is going to look more towards the documentation, privacy side, uh, compliance, regulatory compliance. And then, you know, like a systematic regular, you have to be meeting on a regular basis. You have to educate your staff. Um, training, training. Everybody does have monthly training. Every, but, you know, there's, there's electronic systems that are, I mean, yearly training. There's electronic systems out there to help you. I understand they're expensive, but you have to put systems in place. You have to train your people. You have to know you trained your people, and you have to... Make sure that you can demonstrate that folks understood what you trained them. Um, so the compliance training materials are tailored to meet all level of needs. Maybe the compliance da data that you provide for your psychiatrist is not the same that you provide for your peers. They have different level of background and different r requirements in the organization. Compliance manual and code of comment. conduct should be distributed upon hire. This is what you start talking about the first day somebody walks in the door. It's part of your initial training. It's part of it's 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 baked in to the expectation that you have of every single employee, and you start that conversation right at the beginning, and you keep you keep reminding people. I get security updates all the time uh, in my email. You should be doing that for the compliance side also. And it needs to be confidential. Obviously, you have to, you know, you have to have the tip line. That has to be confidential. People need to be, to understand that they have an opportunity to report what they see or the suspicions that they have uh, and in a, in a, in a way that, um, they need not be concerned about that. Uh, and you should provide that information.
information not only to the your staff but also to the individuals that you serve. It's like anything else. If you see something, if you feel that um, there's an abuse or that you're being coerced or that somehow there's you're suspicious of activity, uh, then that's something that your your clients also have an opportunity to talk about. And of course, you need enforcement. So, you know, compliance needs to be part of your performance evaluation systems. Uh, yeah, you have to be. You have to be sure that people are following regulatory requirements. You have to be able to document and demonstrate that you're you're reviewing that uh, with your staff, and that's part of your evaluation process. And then there's discipline. That's usually built in the policy and procedure manual. What are the disciplines? With the old phrase, up to and including termination. Um, and then there's auditing and monitoring and self-reporting. Uh, the only way you understand what's going on is if you're closely looking. You're looking at claims. You're looking at documentation. You're looking for inconsistencies. Um, you're, you have an open tip line. You know that there's no intimidation of your staff or your clients, that you're transparent about what you find, uh, and that you take action based upon what you're looking at. I think self-report is a extremely important piece of this, you're going to make mistakes. Everybody, I think if you talk to OMEG, they're going to say nobody is perfect. And if you're not finding your imperfection and you're not documenting your imperfection, I would propose that you do not have an effective compliance program. So you have Here's your, you know, you have to have responses. You have to have correction action plans. Uh, you have to have your work plan. There's a, you do have to do your internal assessments. There's an assessment tool on the OMIG website. Uh, you have to have a work plan that is comprehensive, it has to have tasks, has to have target dates, who's responsible, uh, when's it going to be done, how do you know that it's going to be done effectively, and this piece about non-retaliation intimidation, uh, people need to be safe to be able to point out what they see and what they suspect. If they're wrong, they're wrong. Um, but you have to have an environment where people are vigilant and feel comfortable that if they think that something's going on, that they will be protected. Um, and some folks, they do exit interviews includes the compliance officers. Anything, now that you're leaving, is there anything that you didn't feel comfortable telling us? Some folks, is once they're leaving your employee, feel much more comfortable talking about what they saw because now they, uh, if they were fair, afraid of intimidation. And even to the point of maybe giving some people some time to think about it after they've left and to reach out to them. So we've got, I've got about nine minutes left. Um, I'd just like to sort of in review, um, I think that these topics of are, are critical in terms of business practice. I think they are as equally or if not more important today uh, than they were a month ago. I think we are in an environment that we are all doing the best we possibly can uh, to reach out and meet the needs of the individuals and the families and communities we serve with a relaxation of some of the re regulations I think is, there is going to be a retrospective review I think there are going to be audits and I think that you are, it's going to be incumbent upon you to be able to document and prove uh, that you followed those regulations, that you've documented those correctly, and that is an extremely important aspect of reducing the risk for you and your organization. So with that, uh, Meg, do we have any questions that came in that I might be able to uh, attempt to answer? Yes. So, um, David, thank you so much for walking us through all of that. We do so far have one or two questions that I'll start with, okay. but I just want to encourage everyone, um, just as a reminder, please keep them coming in. We are collecting them all, so even if we don't get to address all of your questions, 
we are hoping to address the ones that we aren't able to speak to today on our office hours um, in two weeks. Um, and just as a gentle plug for that, please register and join us on the 30th. Um, we'll be joined by David and Fern and Roe. All of our wonderful expert presenters are going to join us that day. Um, so with that, David, I'm going to dive into questions for you. So sure. uh, this first question um, is about the compliance committee. And I think someone's wondering mm -hmm. in terms of like the regular established process, do you recommend that they meet every other month, every quarter, kind of what's your recommendation around that? Yeah, I think that if we go back to the best practice slides around the conference, uh, blah, 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 compliance program oversight, and here the, we, we make the recommendation that it, it meets monthly or at the very least bi-monthly. I know that monthly is, is a difficult thing. So my, my recommendation would be is, is that uh, the, the client compliance officer is working all the time. Um, and so the compliance officer should probably be in communication with the CEO around the work and what they're doing and any findings um, on a regular monthly basis. I think the compliance committee meeting on a bi-monthly basis would probably be a minimum standard. I think quarterly, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that anybody would fault you for quarterly, but I think bi-monthly to keep it active and assure that we're, um, that's an ongoing process that the CEO is, um, is, uh, kept informed, and we had the compliance officer make a report to the board on a monthly basis. Got it. Next. That's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question I have, so this is around kind of uh, what you talked about with the exit interviews. And so uh -huh. one of the attendees is wondering if this, if this was required um, or in your example or if this is simply a best practice. I do not believe that it's required. I do believe that it's a best practice. Um, mm -hmm. I think exit interviews are an extremely com important component. And most organizations do exit interviews and they, they leave it to the, um, they leave it to HR. In our, our organization, we did have the compliance officer make at least a, a connected with all of the individual employees who were leaving our employee. employee didn't have to necessarily be a long process, but there was always a statement and a request to uh, employees who were exiting, uh, asking them uh, very explicitly whether there was any activity that they saw during their employment uh, that they would like to now discuss. Uh, so they, Great. You, I think that in best practice, you give everybody the oppor explicit opportunity to talk with you about something that they may have saw, seen that they were afraid to talk about while they were employed. Great, thank you. That's, that's helpful kind of framing, I think, as well um, for the purpose and, of that and whatnot. Um, okay, so just a quick question that I can actually answer. So a few folks have asked us about whether or not they can have access to the PowerPoints. And yes, I'm happy to say um, after this webinar wraps up, we're going to share both the PowerPoint slides and the recording of this webinar. So you will have easy and ready access to this. Um, you'll get an email with information on how to find this, but you can also always visit the NICTAC website and CTAC website and find it there. Um, okay, our next question. Um, so here's a question about documentation. <laughs> um, and, you know, in reviewing documentation, probably as a clinical supervisor, what if you're noticing that a clinician is putting the same verbiage for interventions that are used, let's say, for psychotherapy for each client? What if the same verbiage repeats itself in the documentation? Is that a red flag? Is that something um, that should be addressed? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts would be that it would be a red flag. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, but it, it, it could be a red flag that 
um, your therapist is just not being creative or they just can't see nuanced differences from client to mm -hmm. client or they're lazy and they're just using the same language all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that every single individual that we work with is unique. Now, there is commonality that crosses individuals, but if you're not seeing a more nuanced approach to their documentation, then I think that at the very least some training would be necessary to help people understand some of the differentiation from from client to client. I wouldn't look at that necessarily from uh this is a this is a bad therapist. I would look at right. maybe we need yeah. some training to better to help this individual better understand how to reflect uh, in a more nuanced way the difference from uh, from client to client. Absolutely. I think in my experiences of my limited time as a supervisor, I would use that as a check-in point. <laughs> you know, if I noticed that, I would say, this is time for us to check in. Um, I'm noticing this as a pattern. Um, <laughs> let's have a talk. <laughs> um, so thank you for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> and I will be the first to tell you, it's been a while since I was a clinical supervisor. <laughs> um, but I think that, but I think those. You're absolutely right. It's time just to check in. This, yeah. the, all these individuals yeah. can't be the same. Something's going on. Of course, exactly, exactly. So I'm going to ask one last question, and I want to thank you all sure. for. Um, we have a couple more, but David will send you those, and we can address those on the office hour. Um, so the last question is: What if your organization um, might not have a, a compliance officer? You know, who might be, is there a recommended person who might be able to take over those compliance obligations? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. It really depends on the size one? of the organization. <laughs> well, yeah. It's, it, yeah, yeah. it depends on the, I think it depends on the size of, of the organization. I think mm -hmm. it has to be somebody outside of executive leadership. It can't be the CEO. I don't think it, I mean, I suppose you could put that in the clinical director, but I think there needs to be mm -hmm. some separation. Um, most folks do some kind of have somebody doing quality assurance. Um, it really is a position that stands alone. I understand that it could be difficulty financially, um, but I, I think it needs, those responsibilities need to be given to an individual who can act independently, who feels mm -hmm. comfortable reporting to the board of directors and to the CEO, uh, and is strong enough to stand up to the CEO uh, just in case the CEO does not agree with what the compliance officer is saying. It's a difficult position. And that's a hard question to answer, but it, they have to be an independent individual. Yeah. And I'm sorry to end on that difficult question, David. I didn't mean to stump you on that, but I think you, I think what you said <laughs> is true. Okay. That the, There's no good answer. I mean, it's <laughs> all. No, I know. <laughs> it's true. There's no straightforward, simple cookie cutter answer no. on that one. Um, but I, I do want to thank you, David, for all of your insight and knowledge that you shared with us today. And I want to thank everyone who chatted in questions. I'm sorry for those of you who we didn't get to directly answer, but know that we have your question and we'll be addressing those, prioritizing addressing those on our office hours that will be in two weeks. So thank you and be sure to join us then. Um, and I do hope everyone um, is just taking good care of themselves and their families and their colleagues. And, and we hope to talk to you soon on our next um, office hour for this business and best practices management webinar series. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.